Hello, Sheridan Hills family. Hi. Hi. We are glad to be with you guys this evening. Even if we can't physically be together, we have this way to, to digitally be with each other. We hated that we weren't able to do the Passover say that we had planned in March together as a church, but we found out a way that we can actually do it together. So we hope that you guys enjoy this Good Friday service as we celebrate the Lord together and see the connections between the Passover and Jesus the Messiah. After the, the Passover Seder, I'm going to share a little bit about our, our family and our ministry and things we do here in South Florida, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Enjoy! Welcome everybody to our interactive Passover Seder. We're glad that you could join us tonight. Hopefully you've already been on the website, you've downloaded the material that's there. We're going to have an interactive experience tonight, so you can go to the website, you can download uh, a copy of the Haggadah that we're going to be working through. You can download a list of elements that you need to partake in the Seder, so you can be joining in with us as we celebrate this Passover Seder. Uh, as you know, many of us are locked down because of uh, coronavirus and have missed out on opportunities to celebrate Passover Seder together with churches or with family members. And so we thought it'd be a great experience to be able to share this with you, invite you into our homes, so you could share this with, with us. My name is Stephen Cawthon. I work with Life and Messiah International here in South Florida. Life and Messiah has been sharing God's heart for the Jewish people since 1887. This involves working with churches and individuals to, to, share, to teach them the importance of the Jewish people in God's plan, as well as ways that they can take stands against anti-Semitism. We also share God's love by sharing the gospel, the truth of the gospel, with unbelieving Jewish people so that they can see that Jesus is the Messiah. Life of Messiah has staff all around the world. We have staff in Israel, France, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, Canada, Argentina, and Mexico. We also have staff here in the U.S. in Brooklyn, Chicago, Seattle, North Carolina, and South Florida. As I said, we're happy to have you joining us for this Seder tonight. A Seder is a Hebrew word that means order. A Passover Seder has a specific order to it that we're going to be working through. Jewish people all around the world tonight are celebrating the same Passover order, Passover Seder. And as we go through these things, it's all about remembering God's redemption. Because you see, Passover is about redemption. But tonight, redemption is not just going to be some kind of a vague idea that we talk about. It's going to be something that we, we, we taste and we see and we touch and we experience together. Passover is about taking time at least once a year to remember the redemption that God has brought to us. Our observance of Passover, we call Messiah in the Passover, is based on a traditional Jewish observance, but we also have added in parallels that we see that point towards Jesus as the Messiah. And so as we're working through the different aspects, you'll see these opportunities where you can see both the, the redemption of the God brought to the Jewish people from Egypt and also our redemption in Jesus, the Messiah. So the first part of a Passover Seder is actually not me giving a little speech. It's the woman of the house coming and lighting candles. So Passover is a family experience. It's something that's meant to be celebrated together as families, close together. So my family is going to participate in different parts of the Seder this evening. And my wife is going to come and light the Seder blessing and light the candles for us. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידשנו במצוותיו ונתן לנו את בני העולם ישוע. אמן. Blessed are you אדוני הגעד, King of the Universe, who has sent us apart by his commandments and is giving us the light of the world ישוע. אמן. אמן. So if you have the Haggadah and are following along with us, we're on page 6 in the Haggadah. So Haggadah means story or telling. It's the idea of retelling what God has done in the past. And on page six in the Haggadah, we see about the, the first cup, Kadesh. So in a Passover Seder, there are four cups of wine or grape juice that you drink. And so you should have a cup, you should have some grape juice, whatever you have there on the table. There's going to be four times we're going to pour that, and we're going to drink from the cups. Uh, these four cups stand for the four I will statements that God made in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 through 7, where it says this, Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, 
and I will bring you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will take you, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians. So go ahead and pour the first cup. For every cup, we also say a blessing over the cup. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, melech haolam, borei pri hagefen. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. The next part of the Seder is the uchatz, the washing. So everybody's very conscious about hand washing these days. And so we didn't add this in just because of that. It's actually a part of the Passover Seder and has been for a long time. If you notice, there's a very specific way of washing the hands. This is a ceremonial, traditional way of washing the hands. And it harkens back to when the priests in the tabernacle and the temple would wash their hands in the basin before they would enter into the tabernacle or the temple. But what's interesting is also we see this in the New Testament. In Matthew 15, we see that the Pharisees had very specific rules and traditions about hand washing. And Jesus explained the, the, this also in a very interesting way to his disciples. In Matthew 15, 17 through 20, he said, Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth and goes into the stomach is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. You see, Jesus is not talking against hand washing. He's simply saying that it's not the cleaning of the hands, the exterior, that is the most important. Our hands need to be washed, but also our hearts need to be cleansed from sin as well. So next page, page 8, we have the karpas. So if you have your Seder plate set up or you have the things on the table, you should have some parsley or some other little greens there. So we're going to take the parsley and dip it in salt water. And just as a question to think about, do you guys remember? What was it on the original Passover? What did the Hebrew people use to put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils? You remember? It was hyssop. Hyssop. So the karpas, this parsley, is a symbol of the hyssop that was used to put the blood on the doorposts and the lentils. And hyssop is an interesting thing in scripture because we see that hyssop is talked about being used to cleanse leprosy. It's talked about used to be cleansing uncleanness if you came into contact with death. And then in Psalm 51, we see David saying, purge me with hyssop. Scripture is very, very clear all throughout. All of us are guilty of sin and needs to be and need to be cleansed. And hyssop is a symbol, not just of that putting on the doorpost and the lentils, but it's also a symbol of the cleansing that we all need. But we also dip it in salt water. Why the salt water? Salt water is, as uh, you guys know, is very similar to our tears. And so this salt water is a symbol of the tears that were shed by the slaves when they were in Egypt. Slavery brings tears. It's an obvious thing. And this is one of the things we remember as we celebrate the Passover Seder is the bitterness, the hardness, the difficulty that was involved in slavery. But one thing for us to remember is it's not just slave, slaves in Egypt that we're remembering tonight. In John 8, 34, Jesus says, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So you see, every single one of us has been a slave to sin in our lives. All of us have sinned. All of us have been a slave to sin. And so dipping this parsley, this karpas, into the salt water is a remembrance of the need to be cleansed and the tears that come from slavery and sin. So dip the, if you haven't already, dip in the salt water and let's say the blessing and then we'll eat it all together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam pri ha'adama. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the earth. Salty. <laughs> All right. Next, 
we have here a matzatash. Odds are you probably don't have this at home. This is a, something people buy specifically for a Passover Seder. And in this, there are three different pieces of matzah. Right? So there's three levels of it. And on the chatz part of the Seder, you take out the middle of the three matzahs. And you break it in half. So go ahead, you guys do the same. Take a piece of matzah and break it in half. The, uh, the smaller half goes back inside. And the larger half goes into a linen cloth. So we have a specific one for this. You guys can have a just general one, it doesn't matter. It goes inside, and this now, this piece of matzah that we broke is called the afikomen. So the afikomen is very important. The afikomen comes back in later in the Seder, and we're gonna talk more about it. So I'm gonna hand this afikomen off later to my wife, and then we'll see it again later. So the afikomen is actually a symbol of the Passover lamb, because the afikomen is actually the last thing that's eaten at a Passover Seder. In the time of the temple, the lamb would be the last thing that was eaten. Since there's no sacrifice today, no lamb, the, the afikomen has taken the place of the symbolism of being the Passover lamb. So next, on page nine, we have the Magid. The Magid is the retelling of the Passover the story. This is the, the main section of the Passover Seder, where we just go through and we just talk about different aspects of what happened at that original Seder. And so on page nine, we have a prayer here that comes from before the destruction of the temple. And so it says, this is the bread of affliction, which our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Let all who are in need come and celebrate Passover. Today we are here, next year in the land of Israel. Today we are slaves, next year we will be free. So now we're gonna go ahead and pour the second cup. We're not gonna drink it yet, but take the grape juice and pour the second cup. We're gonna need that in just a minute. Next on page 10, we have ma nishtana, the four questions. So the four questions are four questions to ask, why is this night different? What's different? Why are we not having a normal meal? Why are things different from what is normal in a family setting? And the tradition is that the youngest, the youngest child able to recite the four questions reads them or says them. So my son Noam, who's five and a half, is gonna come and read the four questions for us. So come Noam. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat either leavened bread or matzah. Why on this night do we only eat matzah? Hmm? On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. Why on this night must we eat bitter herbs? On all other nights, we do not dip orb even once. Why on this night do we dip twice into salt, water, and into sweet fruit? Mm -hmm. on, all, on all other nights, everyone sits up or reclines while eating. Why on this night do we all recline? Good job, Norm. Thank you. So these four questions, the one thing that draws out, especially to younger children, what's going on, right? Why is this night different from all others? And the answers are actually long and drawn out and tied up in the Haggadah and the readings that you do. But just briefly, shortly, I want to give you the answer to the four questions so you know what's going on. So the first one is, why the matzah, right? Other nights you eat whatever kind of bread you want. For Jewish people, Around the world during Passover, the, day, the evening of Passover and the week after, you only eat unleavened bread, matzah. And so the answer is they, they only eat matzah because the Hebrews could not wait for the bread to rise when they were fleeing slavery in Egypt. And so the bread was flat when it came out of the oven. It's a remembrance of the flat bread. They didn't have time for it to rise. That's Exodus 12, 39. Second question is, on other nights, we eat all kinds of different vegetables. Why on this night, bitter herbs? So on our Seder plate, we have some bitter herbs there. Why are you eating those specifically on this night? And the answer is we eat uh, maror, a bitter herb, to remind us of the bitterness of slavery. That's Exodus 1.14. We'll talk more about that later also. Third question, why are we dipping, right? We already dipped the parsley into the salt water. Later, we're going to dip the bitter herb into the choroset. Why are we doing this? 
The first one, the parsley in the salt water, symbolizes the replacing of tears with gratefulness. And the second dip, later, the maror in the haroset, symbolizes the sweetening of our burden of bitterness and suffering. And the last question is about the reclining, which uh, takes a little bit of explanation because I'm standing, right? So typically, when you're sitting eating a Passover Seder, you're going to be reclining, you're going to relax, have some pillows around you, leaning to the side, this way or that way. And you recline at the Seder because in ancient times, a person who reclined at a meal was a free person, while slaves and servants stood. So being a free man, free woman, you're reclining at the table, you're at your leisure. And so Passover is a reminder of that, a reminder of being free, that we're no longer slaves. So the Magid, the narration, the retelling of the story. I want you guys to do some interaction. I mean, you know, I can't hear what you're going to say, but you guys can hear what you're going to say. I want you to think a minute and work with me through the story of what happened to the Hebrews in Egypt. For, so first off, think for a minute. You can say out loud if you want, to, within your family, your group, whoever's there. Why, why were the Hebrews in Egypt in the first place? I mean, it wasn't where they were from, right? So think about it. Do you remember? Why were they in Egypt? What happened that they ended up being there. Because you see, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were in the land of Canaan. Right? They were in the land of Canaan. They were living there. It was the land that God promised to them. But there came a famine. A famine came into the land. And you guys probably remember the story of Joseph and everything that happened. It's amazing. If you don't remember it, after this, you should go and read in Genesis. Genesis. It's an amazing story of how God preserved his people by bringing Joseph into a position of power that allowed... Jacob and his other children and the grandchildren, everybody, to all come to the land of Egypt. So they were there in the land of Egypt. And think with me again. How were they treated? How were they treated there in the land of Egypt? Were they treated good or were they treated badly? Well, in the beginning, they were treated well, right? They were treated well. uh, Joseph was in power and uh, the people came in. They got a choice land. They got a lot of things. But then, Scripture says, there arose a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. And things turned drastically. And suddenly, the people of Egypt were persecuting the Jewish people. They enslaved them. And it's interesting that people have talked about in the past, well, you know, maybe it wasn't slavery. Maybe it was just like indentured servitude. You know, they had to work. They They had to do community service. But if you look at the scriptures, that was not the situation at all. Somebody doing community service or indentured servitude doesn't have their children killed by the leader. And this is what happened. Pharaoh was ordering the people to throw the, the, the children into the river. This is not just normal work. This is slavery. This is no right to choose what you do in your life. So in the beginning, they were treated well, but eventually they were treated very badly. They were enslaved. They had no freedom to choose what they wanted. And then lastly, the big point, how did God bring them out? Right? Think about it for yourselves, amongst yourselves there as you're listening. What did God do to bring the Hebrews out of the land of Egypt. It's an amazing story. It's why we get together on Passover every year to remember this. He sent Moses. He sent Moses, a man who said that he wasn't able to speak. He wasn't able. He sent him to Pharaoh and told him to let the people go. Let the people to go and worship God. And when, the Moses, and when Pharaoh resisted, when Pharaoh resisted, God brought what? The ten plagues. He brought plague after plague on the people. And still Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And God said, well, if that's what you want, Let your heart be hardened. And God brought more and more until the last plague. And so it's an amazing story of God bringing his people to a place to save them. And when things went poorly, when things went really badly, and they cried out to him, he saved them, redeemed them from that situation. So in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 5 through 8, there's a just really great summary of this whole idea. And it says this, Deuteronomy 26, 5 through 8. You are to respond by saying in the presence of the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt with a few people and lived there. There he became a great, powerful, and populous nation. But the Egyptians mistreated and afflicted us and forced us to do hard labor. So we called out to, to God, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our cry and saw our misery, hardship, and oppression. Then the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand, and with an outstretched arm, with terrifying power, and with signs and wonders. Amen. 
So we're going to skip ahead a little bit in the Haggadah. We're going to look now on page 20. So on page 20 is the Esr Makot, the 10 plagues, the 10 plagues. Um, most of us have a hard time remembering all 10 of them, right? Some people by now actually say there was an 11th one with the coronavirus going around, but it's not quite, not quite. So the 10 plagues, what we're going to do to remember them is we're going to say the plague, and then every time you say the plague, you're going to dip your finger in the grape juice and drop a drop on a plate in front of you. Okay, so we just we'll dip it, and then as we say the plague, we drop a drop on the plate. Hopefully you've washed your hand already. I did. You saw me. So we're going to do it like this to make it easy. I'm going to say the plague and drop the drop, and then you guys say it after me at home and drop the drop on the plate. Okay, so page 20 in the Haggadah. Ready? Blood, frogs, lice, flies, cattle disease, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, death of the firstborn. And then you can lick your finger. It's a very important Passover tradition, licking your finger after that. All right, the 10 plagues. So these 10 plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians, and it took all the way to the point of the death of the firstborn before Pharaoh would let the people go. Now, actually, this here is my favorite part of the Passover Seder. On page 21, we have Dayenu. Dayenu is a Hebrew word. It means it would have been enough. Die, in Hebrew, die means enough. Die. Which is kind of funny because, you know, uh, Hebrew speakers, you're running around, you go into a mall, you see kids running around, and the parents are yelling, die, die, die. Not quite the same meaning in English, right? But it means enough, stop, enough. Dayenu means enough for us. And so this poem, I'm going to read the whole thing because I love it. The poem says, it would have been enough for us. And it's so important for us to think about this as we're thinking about God's redemption. So, Dayenu. We're starting on page 21. It's going to go to page 22 and 23. I'm going to read. You guys follow along with me. How abundant are the many favors of the Omnipotent upon us. Had he brought us out of Egypt and not executed judgments against the Egyptians, it would have been enough. Dayenu. Had he executed judgments against the Egyptians and not their gods, it would have been enough. Dayenu. Had he executed judgment against their gods and not put to death their firstborn, it would have been enough. Dayenu. Had he put to death their firstborn and not given us their wealth, it would have been enough. Dayenu. Had he given us their wealth and not split the sea for us, it would have been enough. Dayenu. Had he split the sea for us and not led us through on dry land, Dayenu. Had he led us through on dry land and not drowned our oppressors in it, Dayenu. Had he drowned our oppressors in it and not supplied our needs in the desert for 40 years, Dayenu. Had he supplied our needs in the desert for 40 years and not fed us with manna, Dayenu. Had he fed us with manna and not given us the Sabbath, Dayenu. Had he given us the Sabbath, and not brought us to Mount Sinai? Dayenu. Had he brought us to Mount Sinai and not given us the Torah? Dayenu. Had he given us the Torah and not brought us into Israel? Dayenu. Had he brought us into Israel and not built a temple for us? It would have been enough. Dayenu. So what's so important about this idea of Dayenu? You know, so many times when we think about our relationship to God, we think about coming to Him and asking Him for things. God, I need this, and you know, God, I want this, and God, help me with this, and God, give me that, and God, give me this, and God, give me that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay for us to ask God for things. We can ask God, we can come to Him, we can ask Him. But it's so easy to forget how many great things He's already done for us. It's so easy to be focused on the now of what I need and what I want, that we don't stop and take time to think, wow, God, you've already done so much. And not just that he's done so much, but he's done so much that he didn't need to do any of it. Dayenu. God, you went above and beyond what we could have ever expected and gave us all of these great and amazing things. 
And so at this time every year <clears throat> of Passover, at least, I think it's important as we're looking at God's redemption to think about this fact of it would have been enough. You didn't have to go so far and bring us redemption, but God, you did. And for us as believers in Jesus, we could add a few verses to this poem, couldn't we? We could say, had he died to forgive our sins and not given us eternal life with him? Dayenu. Had he given us eternal life with him and not called us his own sons and daughters? Dayenu. Had he called us his sons and daughters and not given us the Holy Spirit to live in us, it would have been enough. Dayenu. Praise God that he went so far in bringing us our redemption. He went above and beyond. He went beyond what we could ever imagine, far more than we deserve. And he deserves our praise and our thanks for what he has done for us. Amen? Dayenu. I love it. So one other thing that's part of the traditional part of Passover Seder is the song, Dayenu. So we're not going to sing the whole song because, I mean, the poem is long. The song is long also. But we're going to sing just uh, two, two, two phrases in the chorus, two verses in the chorus. So hopefully you downloaded the Dayenu uh, lyrics from the website also. And I want you guys to follow along with me. So we're going to sing the first verse twice and then the chorus and then the second verse twice and then the chorus again. Before we get started, let's go over the verse. So the first verse, it says, I'll say it, you guys repeat after me. Ilu, hotsi, hotsi anu. Hotsi anu, mi mitzrayim. It's not so easy, I know, right? <laughs> and then, dayenu, right? Everybody, dayenu. And the chorus is, dai dayenu. The second verse, ilu, natan, everybody repeat, natan lanu, Natan lanu et hatora. Okay? And then you come into the chorus. So, I'll sing the chorus one time in the beginning so you get a feel of it, and then we'll try. You, you better be singing at home. I can't see you, but I, I, I'll find some way to find out if you're leaving me alone, not singing along with me. So, the chorus. Dai, dai, enu, dai, dai, enu. Dai, dai, enu, dai, enu, dai, enu, dai, enu, dai, dai, enu. Dai, dai, enu, dai, dai, enu, dai, enu, dai, enu. Okay, you think I got it? So we're gonna start with the verse, top verse twice, then the chorus, bottom verse twice, chorus. Here we go. Ilu hotsi hotsi anu hotsi anu mi mitzrayim hotsi anu mi mitzrayim dai enu. Ilu hotsi hotsi anu hotsi anu mi mitzrayim hotsi anu mi mitzrayim dai enu. Dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai enu, dai enu, dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai enu, dai enu. Ilu natan natan lanu, natan lanu eta tora, natan lanu eta tora, dai enu. Ilu natan natan lanu, natan lanu eta tora, natan lanu eta tora, dai enu. Dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai enu, dai enu, dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai enu, dai enu. Good job. Give yourself a hand if you sung along. So, dai enu. It's a great, great idea as we're celebrating Passover, the redemption, to remember God's overwhelming abundance in bringing us this redemption. All right, so back to the Haggadah. On page 24, so one of the aspects of Passover that's really important is explaining the original elements. You see, at the first Passover, so there's two different things we're talking about. We have the first Passover, the one that happened there in Egypt, the night where the people were fleeing. And then we have the one that's been celebrated every year for thousands of years after that, remembering that first event. And so every year after that, it's important to remember the elements that were there at the first Passover. We have extra stuff going on that wasn't necessarily there, but there were three things that God told the people to have. One was the lamb, another was the unleavened bread, and another was the bitter herbs. 
So we're going to look first at page 24 about the Pesach, the Passover lamb. So there on page 24, you can read along with me, I'm going to read this. The Passover lamb, which our ancestors ate when the second temple stood. What is the reason for it? Because the Holy One, blessed is He, passed over the houses of our ancestors in Egypt. As it is said, and this is quoting Exodus 12, 27, You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of, when, houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt, when He smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. So there is no longer any temple. When there was a temple, a tabernacle, every year there was a Passover lamb that was sacrificed to remember what had been done at that first Passover. Instead, we have a dry lamb's shank bone. This is a reminder of there is no lamb. There is no sacrifice. There's no blood in this shank bone. But the interesting thing is, is that for we who are believers in Jesus, there is a lamb. On the next page, 25, John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Messiah, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. So the New Testament writers saw this parallelism. They saw the Passover lamb pointing clearly towards Jesus the Messiah. And uh, continuing with me on page 25, it says, It's no coincidence that Yeshua, Jesus, presented himself in Jerusalem four days before Passover on Palm Sunday. At his trial, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shears. He did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. He was pronounced guiltless by Pilate which is John 19, 4. And like the Passover lamb, and unlike the criminals on either side, not one of his bones was broken. You see, there's all these connections there that show us clearly that even though there is no temple, there is no Passover lamb sacrificed year after year, we as believers in Jesus do have a Passover lamb. That is Jesus the Messiah who died in our place. And just as the blood of the lamb had to be applied to save the lives of each firstborn at the time of the first Passover, right? So the blood had to be applied. Have you ever thought about that, actually? What a strange thing for God to ask the people to do, right? We've heard about it. We grew, maybe you grew up hearing it. It seems normal for you. But if somebody told you to go outside and paint around the door of your house with blood, would you think that was normal? That doesn't seem normal at all. God had saved the Jewish people from all, the Hebrews, from all the other nine plagues. Why now was he requiring them to do something, and specifically something that seems so strange and so odd? You see, the blood itself didn't actually do anything. It was their faith and trusting in God to do that, their faith that they did that, that was what produced something. They trusted God, and because they did what he said in trusting him, they were spared. And so that faith is an important aspect. And so in the same way, by faith... We must individually apply the blood of the Lamb of God to remove the sentence of death from us. By faith, we trust in the sacrifice of Jesus to cover over us so that God will pass over our sin. Isaiah 53, 6, We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished Him for the iniquity of us all. All of us are guilty. John three sixteen, which so many people know, For God so loved the world, in this way, he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So that was the first original element, the Passover lamb, the, the dry shank bone, the parallel we see with Jesus, who is our Passover lamb. The next element was the matzah, the unleavened bread. So on page 26, we see the matzah. It says, matzah, what does it symbolize? There was not sufficient time for the dough to, of our ancestors to rise when the supreme king of kings, the holy one, blessed be he, revealed himself to them. As it is said, it's quoting here Exodus 12, 39, they baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leaven. So when they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. So the matzah was a symbol of the haste with which they left 
Egypt. But also we see in the scriptures that leaven, yeast, is a symbol of sin. And so it's an interesting passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 through 8. Paul is writing to a mostly Gentile church, and what does he say to them? He says, clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch. You are indeed unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us observe the feast, not with the old yeast or with the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Paul writing this is making a parallel between the idea of being unleavened, without yeast, without this sin infecting us, so that we would be unleavened, holy before God. <clears throat> Next, on page 27, we have the moror, the bitter herb. So you see here, we have some horseradish. Hopefully you guys could find some horseradish, the good strong stuff that makes you cry. But why bitter herbs? What's the point of bitter herbs? Why do we eat bitter herbs? Because the Egyptians embittered the lives of our ancestors in Egypt, as it is said, and quoting Exodus 1.14 here, and made their lives bitter with difficult labor in brick and mortar and in all kinds of field work. They ruthlessly imposed all this work on them. You see, life is full of bitterness, but especially life is full of the bitterness of sin. Uh, we see that in Isaiah 53, 3, Jesus is one who can sympathize with this. He says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like one people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Jesus never suffered the bitterness of sin, but he suffered the bitterness of living a life here in this world and being despised and hated by others. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you haven't. A lot of us have. But Jesus knows what that is. He can sympathize with the bitterness that comes in our lives. And so the bitter herb is a member of the bitterness of slavery and sin and the bitterness of life here on earth. Next, on page 28. It says, in every generation, therefore, each individual is obligated to consider as though he or she had personally gone out of Egypt. I mean, think about that for a minute. Every individual, every generation is supposed to think about themselves as if they had gone through it. To remember that this is not just something that happened long ago, but is practically relevant to you. And then it quotes here from Deuteronomy 6.23. On that day, explain to your son, this is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. I'm sorry, that was Exodus 13, 8. And then after that, uh, it says, Not only did the Holy One, blessed be He, redeem our ancestors, but also us with them, as it is said. This is Deuteronomy 6, 23. But He brought us from there in order to lead us in and give us the land that He swore to our fathers. So then together at the bottom it says, We therefore are privileged to thank, praise, adore, glorify, exalt, honor, bless, and reverence Him who performed all these miracles for our ancestors and therefore for us. For you brought us forth from bondage to freedom, from sorrow to joy, from mourning to a festive day, from darkness to great light, and from slavery to redemption. Hallelujah. So the next section is Hallel. Hallel is praise. This is a time of, as I mentioned before, Passover is a joyous time. So this is a time of praising God, rejoicing in Him, and what He's done. <clears throat> so there are two psalms here. There's a lot of times songs that would be sung. We're going to read these two psalms, Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. During the period of the Second Temple, uh, Hallel was recited during the afternoon slaughtering of the Passover lamb, and then again at night when the lamb was eaten. And you see that in Mark 14, 26 that it talks about after the Last Supper, which was a Passover meal, it says, after singing psalms, they went out. So, Psalm 113. Hallelujah! Give praise, servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, let the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord is exalted above all the nations, His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the earth and the heaven, the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the garbage pile in order to seat them with nobles, with the nobles of his people. He gives the childless woman a household, making her the joyful mother of children. 
Hallelujah. And then on the next page, page 30, is Psalm 114. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people who spoke a foreign language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why was it sea that you fled, Jordan that you turned back? Mountains that you skip like rams, hills like lambs. Tremble earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. And so as we're remembering God's redemption, it is the best time to praise Him. Always we should praise Him, but especially as we're remembering all the great things that He's done, just to praise Him and sing out how great He is. So now we have the second cup that we poured earlier. This is the second of the, the, the four I will statements where God said, I will rescue you from slavery to them. So this is the cup of rejoicing, the cup of remembering God's rescue. So we say the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, melech haolam, borei pri hagefen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. So next is rachatz. This is another washing of the hands. And whenever I do this, celebrating Passover, I always think about Jesus at the Last Supper. You, know, you guys probably remember what Jesus did in the middle of the supper, right? It had to do with washing. It's a very interesting occurrence. In John 13, we see this. It says, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So this was an amazing example that Jesus set. I mean, imagine, imagine we're not doing this through digital means, right? Imagine we're all together, I'm up here, I'm leading the Seder, I'm talking these things to you guys. But instead of washing my hands, I instead get down on the ground, take off your shoes and start washing your feet. That's, that's pretty out there, right? I mean, but it, you probably have clean feet anyway, but these were people were walking around not having showers every day, with sandals, out in the dirt, and this was pretty disgusting, right? So why was Jesus doing this? I mean, why was Jesus, the Messiah, getting down to wash the nasty, stinking feet of the disciples? He was showing us an example. He was showing us that this is what it is like to live as redeemed people. It's not about looking out for yourself and looking out for your own good. It's about serving one another. He said, you should do this. He said, As I wash, you should wash one another's feet. We should be looking out for the needs of other people. Even if it's humiliating, even if it's humbling, this is how we can be living as people who are redeemed, doing what God has called us to, which is loving one another. And Jesus set an example for that. All right, next we have motzeh, the prayer for the bread. So we're gonna, everybody's going to take a piece of the matzah. You've probably been looking at it this whole time, wondering how it tastes, right? So we break off a piece. So this is the symbol of the haste in which the Hebrews left Egypt. This is also the symbol we talked about earlier of our lives lived holy before God. And so we say the blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzei lechem min haaretz. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Good. So next, we have the moror, the bitter herbs. <clears throat> so you're going to take another piece of matzah, break it off, and then you're going to get a little bit of the, the bitter herbs, the horseradish or whatever else you might have substituted to go on that. <clears throat> Be careful if you got real horseradish, because that stuff has pretty good kick to it. I uh, never ate horseradish growing up, so the first time I took part in a Passover Seder, I saw people getting just a tiny little amount of it, and I thought, what is this? You know, I'm a big man. I can take care of this. So I got a big scooping hunk of uh, horseradish, and I almost choked on the whole thing trying to get it down. 
So be careful with it. So let's eat this together and then I'll tell you why in the world we're doing such a ridiculous thing. So if you got it strong enough, <clears throat> it's supposed to bring some, ears, some tears to your eyes and maybe clear your sinuses at the same time. But why would we do that? <clears throat> why do we eat bitter herbs that bring tears to our eyes? In the same way that the herbs bring tears to our eyes, slavery brings tears to those who are enslaved. To the Hebrews who are in Egypt. It wasn't a party. It's not just some story we remember, we tell our kids for the fun times and you know, the cool movies that we can make from it. This was a bitter, hard time. And it's worth remembering the difficulties of it. You can never really understand how great a redemption is, the redemption that God brings, until you understand how bad it was before. But as we mentioned before, it's not just the Hebrews in Egypt that we're remembering as being slaves. We also have been slaves to sin. We've been slaves to sin. And let me tell you, sin brings tears. Maybe not right at the moment. You know, maybe you commit sin and it's no big deal and nothing happens, but down the road it brings tears in your life or in somebody else's life. Everything that God calls sin, it's, it's something that's wrong for us. It's not random things that He calls sin. It brings tears. It brings hard times in our lives. And we, every single one of us, should remember that we were slaves to sin. Or maybe you're still a slave to sin. If you've never accepted God's redemption available through Jesus, then that moror, that bitter herb, that's what you have now. You just have the tears. But it's not the end of it. So the next is the korech. The kore. So take two pieces of matzah now. <clears throat> with one, you're going to get a little bit of the horseradish. And with the other, you're going to get some of the, the apple sweet mixture that we have. The horoset. And you're going to make a little sandwich out of them. Okay, you're going to make a sandwich out of them. So it says that we're on page 34 now, if you're following along. During the time when the temple stood, Hillel ate the matzah and the bitter herbs together to fulfill the law. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs shall they eat the lamb. So unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and we eat the sandwich together. So that's not nearly as bad as the bitter herbs by themselves, right? It's a lot more tolerable, maybe even a little bit nice. So why do we do that? Eating the horseradish, the bitter herbs, together with the sweet horoset, is to symbolize that the bitterness of slavery can be sweetened with the hope of freedom. The bitterness of slavery can be sweetened with the hope of freedom. And so it's the same thing we see in the, in the book of Exodus. You know, that hope of freedom was something that brought sweetness to the, the people. They wanted to be free. But also for us, thinking about sin and redemption in Jesus. We who are believers in Jesus, we have the truth. We have the sweet horoset, you know, the opportunity for freedom to everybody who's living around us, only having the bitterness. So we have the ability to, to bring that sweetness in, to show them there is a way out. But we have to be faithful in sharing that truth with other people. We have to be the chorose, the sweet, sweetens, the moror, the bitter herbs of people's lives as we share the gospel truth with them. So just a few more things here on the plate if you haven't, we haven't gotten to yet. You see there's an egg. There's an egg, a boiled egg or a roasted egg. This is a symbol of the destruction, the reminder of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. In 70 AD, the, the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. And so the egg there is a symbol, a reminder of the temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. We also have here a lettuce. This is a second form of a bitter herb, it's chazeret, just to have two different kinds of bitter herbs on the plate. We don't actually eat it or take part in the seder, it's just there as a, another reminder. All right, so now is the time called shulchan orech, the meal. Normally, if you were doing this live, we would actually be having a meal. It's a bit strange. We're not done with the Seder yet, but this is the way Passover Seder happens. It's part of the beginning, then you have a meal, and then you have the part at the end. So if you're watching this live, we're just going to continue on through to the next part to, uh, to, to not confuse timing. But if you're watching this later and it's not live, you can uh, pause, and you can pause it now, have the meal, and then join back with us after you've finished.
All right. All right, so either you're still with us or you came back after pausing, hopefully. And next we have <clears throat> one of the nicest parts of the Passover Seder is the tzafun, the, the, the hidden. So you remember that earlier we had the afikomen. Yeah, so the afikomen, which was a very important part of the Seder, is typically during the meal hidden around the house somewhere and then the children all rush around trying to find it afterwards. After the meal, they go around, they try to find it. Whoever finds it gets a prize. So my son has the afikomen. He's going to bring it over. Thank you, Nathaniel. Was it hard to find this year? No. no, of course not. Here you go. There's your prize. So whenever I find the afikomen for our family, it's a disaster because it takes them 20 minutes to find it, and usually I have to give them hints. So it's usually better when my wife hides it. But this is the afikomen. You remember, this is the part of the... Uh, the, the middle matzah here that we had, this was a symbol of the lamb, symbolic of the lamb. Not only that, you remember what we did to that middle matzah? We took it and we broke it. Then we wrapped it in a linen cloth. It was hidden away, and whoever receives it, whoever, whoever finds it, receives a prize. Is it starting to sound familiar to you in any way? Look at the matzah. The matzah has stripes on it. And not only that, it has holes. It's pierced. We see in Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punish, our punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Zechariah 12, 10 says, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and on the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. So this afikomen has so many symbolisms that seem, that seem to point towards Jesus. This is not something that's even talked about in Scripture and ordered in Scripture. It's just a tradition that's developed over the years for Jewish people. And what's interesting, uh, most of you probably know that the Last Supper, when Jesus was sitting with his disciples, it was a Passover meal. And it was after the meal that Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave to his disciples to institute what we call the Lord's Supper, or communion. And by coincidence, or maybe by not, this is what Jewish people around the world do with the afikomen every single Passover. Once it's hidden and found, they break it, and everybody partakes a piece of the afikomen. It's the last thing you eat with the meal. And so it's interesting that this, this afikomen is a symbol of the lamb, the middle matzah out of the three, broken, <coughs> wrapped in linen cloth, hidden away. Whoever finds it receives a prize. It's striped, it's pierced, it's unleavened without sin. It's this bread that Jesus chose to be a symbol of his body. Because we see in Luke twenty-two nineteen, 19, it says, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So everybody break a piece of the afikomen. And let's eat this in remembrance of Jesus. Now we come to the third cup. Remember, we have four cups that we're going to drink during the Passover Seder. They stand for the four I will statements that God made in uh, Exodus 6. So go ahead and pour for yourself the third cup. This third cup is the cup of redemption or grace. It's where God said, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. This was God's promise of redemption. And what's interesting is, 
is that ancient Jewish commentary said that this cup was a symbol of the Passover lamb, which the blood of the Passover lamb, which makes total sense, right? Because it was the blood of the Passover lamb that redeemed the people in Egypt. And so this cup of redemption is symbolic of that blood of the Passover lamb. And as you probably already guessed, it was this cup after the meal that Jesus took and said, this is my blood. In Luke 22, 20, it says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, right? The cup after supper. We had two before. This is the one right after supper. He took the cup after supper, the third cup, and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. So let's drink together this cup of redemption, the symbol of the Passover lamb blood. This cup that Jesus said is also a symbol of his blood shed for us to establish the new covenant. Baruch atai Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri HaGefen. Blessed are you, Adonai, King of the universe, who's created the fruit of the vine. <clears throat> for me, it's very powerful to think about this idea that God planned all of these things beforehand. It wasn't just some random thing. There was a connection from eternity past, from the things that God was doing throughout the Old Testament, from Passover, from uh, the things that he told the people to, to remember, even the prophets, and also the, the traditions even that developed, that these things point back to Jesus as the Messiah. And this idea that these things are connected, that, that Jesus didn't come out of nowhere and say, hey, here I am, believe in me. What he was doing was built on the foundation of the prophecies and the, the things that God had foretold about what would happen. And even the thing that Christians do around the world, the, the Lord's Supper, communion, whatever you want to call it, is built on these things connected to the Passover Seder itself. So next, we have a cup here on the side, which you may have seen. All right, this is called Elijah's cup. And so we pour a cup for Elijah. And this is a very, a bit of an unusual tradition, is that the children, one of the children goes to the door and checks the door to see if Elijah's there. So Liel, go check the door to see if Elijah's there for me, and then come over here. We're on page 39, if you guys are following along in the Haggadah. So Liel went to check the door to see if Elijah's there. She's gonna come in here. So, did you see Elijah? No. No, maybe next year. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> and you, you may say to yourself, what in the world? What, what, what kind of strange tradition is this? That you, every Passover, because you do this every year, this is part of the Seder, every Passover you set a place for Elijah, you have a cup for him, and you go to the door to check to see if Elijah's there. Why would you be going, checking to see if Elijah's there? Elijah's dead, right? Right? No. No, Elijah's not dead. If you remember from the scriptures, God took him up into heaven. He did not die. And not only that, but in Micah, chapter 4, verses 5 to 6, it says that God will send Elijah before the great day of the Lord. <clears throat> so there's a prophecy that God will send Elijah back. He didn't die. He was taken up to heaven, but he, that God promised he would come again. And so Jewish people, every Passover, go and check the door for Elijah. Why? because they're looking for the Messiah. Look at this song here on top of page 39. This is a traditional song. I'm not going to sing it for you. I'm just going to read the words. This is what people would sing at Passover. Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah the Gileadite, speedily in our day, come to us with Messiah, son of David. With Messiah, son of David. You see, Jewish people every Passover, every year, look to the door for Elijah not because they were so interested in Elijah, but they want to see the Messiah. They want to see the Messiah. Tonight, which is Passover Eve, if you're watching live with us, around the world, Jewish people are celebrating this, going to look for Elijah because they're longing for the Messiah. And for almost 2,000 years, they've missed it. They've missed it. For 2,000 years almost, they've been going to the door, looking for Elijah, looking for the Messiah, but he already came. And it's something that breaks my heart to think about. 
They're looking, hoping for the Mashiach to come. But he already came. Jesus came. He is the Messiah. He paid the price for people to come to God. And Jewish people desire this. It's deep, deep in their heart. But they missed it. So for us, that should also burden our hearts to think, my goodness, they're they're looking for what we as believers in Jesus already have. They're looking for the Messiah. They've just not come to realize that Jesus is the one that they're looking for. So next we have the section on page 40, Hallel. If you you flip through, there's a a few different psalms here. This is a good time. Usually when we gather as a church or as a family, we'll sing songs together. But we decided tonight just to, to read one of the psalms here. We're going to look at page 44 and read Psalm 118. It's a bit of a long psalm, but there's so many great and powerful things here. So Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let Israel say, His faithful love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His faithful love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His faithful love endures forever. I called to the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and put me in a spacious place. The Lord is for me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? With the Lord for me as my helper, I will look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in nobles. All the nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I destroyed them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I destroyed them. They surrounded me like bees. They were extinguished like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I destroyed them. You pushed me hard to make me fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. There are shouts of joy and victory in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand strikes with power. The Lord's right hand is raised. The Lord's right hand strikes with power. I will not die, but I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord disciplined me severely, but did not give me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness for me. I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord. It is wonderful in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Wow, you could... You could go quite a while talking about this psalm. This is amazing. But uh, if you notice the notes there, verse 22 is quoted in the, New Te- in the New Testament, the New Covenant, several times. Verse 26 is also quoted in the New Testament. Verse 22, you may not see it clearly. It says, uh, sorry, verse 25, it says, Lord, save us. But in Hebrew, it says, Hoshiana. Hoshiana, Hoshana, Hosanna. Sound familiar? Hosanna, Hosanna. It comes from this. So there's so many things here, but again, like we talked about before, it is right and it is good to praise the Lord when remembering the redemption that He has brought to us. And so we praise His name. Next, we look at page 48. So on page 48, we have the fourth cup. So this is the last cup that we have. It stands for the fourth of the four I will statements. Go ahead and pour your cup. This is the fourth of the four I will statements from Exodus 6, where God said, I will take you as my people. I will take you as my people. And it's interesting that for the Jewish people, this is something that happened in the past. God took them for the people. But it's something that still, in a way, is being future because there is an idea, especially we see in Jeremiah 31, 
of God taking the people, them fully as his people as they follow after him in righteousness. Not just to be a physical people, but a spiritual people following after him as well. And so for us who are believers in Jesus, we also see a past and a future aspect of this. We are the people of God. If we are believers in him, then we are part of him. We're, not, uh, we're still separate from the nation of Israel. It's not the same people as the same way as the nation of Israel, the physical descendants, but we are a people of God. We are his people. And so there's still a future aspect for us as well because we are looking again. We know the Messiah came already. He came to die for our sins, to pay that price for our redemption. But we look forward as he is coming again in the future. We know that he will come. We're looking for that because then we'll we'll be even more his people as he dwells among us and we live with him. This is our hope that we look forward to. And very interesting, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, after the Passover Seder, after the the meal, and Jesus institutes the communion with the Afikoman with the third cup, after the third cup, Jesus says, but I tell you, from this moment, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in a new way in my Father's kingdom with you. So I could be wrong, but to me, it seems that at the Last Supper, Jesus did not drink the fourth cup. He drank the third cup of redemption. He said, this is my blood, this is the new covenant. But then he said, that fourth cup, that's going to wait. That fourth cup's going to wait until we drink it together in God's kingdom. And so we drink this cup, this fourth cup, this cup of remembering God taking us to himself as a people with the expectation, looking forward to the day when Yeshua, the Messiah, comes again and we live together with him for eternity. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who's created the fruit of the vine. So with the fourth cup, that's the end of the Passover Seder. We've gone through the elements. We've talked about all the different aspects of it. And on page 49, you see there, there's a traditional greeting at the end of Passover. Shana haba Yerushalayim, Next year in Jerusalem. Passover is one of the holidays where Jewish males were all required to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate. And because so many have been spread around the world for so many years, there's this longing, this idea, looking forward to next year in Jerusalem. And we as believers can say kind of the same thing. We could say, next year in New Jerusalem. Yeah, that we look forward to what God will bring when he comes back and establishes his kingdom here on earth. So I encourage you, as we've gone through this, as we've celebrated this together, to think about the Jewish people around the world, especially tonight if you're watching this live, those who are celebrating Passover this evening, those who are seeing all these symbols all of these things here, and some of them not even knowing why. Most, there's no real explanation for why Jewish people do the afikomen. In tradition, it's just something you do. It's kind of like, well, you do it. It's tradition. But we see that God has used it as symbolism pointing towards Jesus. And so I encourage you, pray for the Jewish people. If you're living in an area where there are Jewish people around you, pray that God will give you an opportunity to share the gospel with them. If not, pray that God will bring believers into Jewish people's lives to share the truth of them. If uh, you have Jewish friends or neighbors or relatives or whatever, talk to them about this. Hey, so you, hey, I celebrated Passover. It was an amazing experience. Talk about some of what you learned. It's a great way to start conversations for the gospel with them. Before we finish, I wanted to take a little bit of time to pray, <clears throat> to pray for the Jewish people, to pray for those around the world who are Jewish, non-Jewish, everybody who are suffering with coronavirus and those of us who are living with fear and uncertainty, just that God would, would bring all of those things under his hand. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your redemption. Thank you that you paid such a high price to bring us salvation. Thank you that you went through all of these things to bring the Hebrews out of Egypt, Lord, And then you showed yourself faithful again in so many ways, but especially in bringing us redemption through Jesus. We praise you, God. You deserve our praise. God, Dayenu, it would have been enough. You went so far beyond and above. 
and we praise you for it. You are great and you're worthy of our praise. We thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to celebrate Passover, even in this time of difficulty around the world. God, we pray that you would be with those who are suffering from coronavirus, those who are, are, are seriously ill, those who are moderately ill, those who are uncertain and are afraid. God, you know all of this. Father, this is not take you by surprise, and you have a plan for all of this. God, I pray that you would be with those, be with us all. Lord, help us to see this as an opportunity to share your truth with others. I pray, God, that even now you would be softening people's hearts to the truth of who you are through this suffering. God, I pray also for the Jewish people who are celebrating Passover this night. I pray, God, that something they see in the Seder would start them asking questions. I pray that you would you would prick their hearts, Lord. You would start them to seek and look at why. Why do we open the door for Elijah? Who could this Messiah be? Father God, I pray, I beg you, bring them people into their lives who will share the truth of your word with them. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us your truth. I thank you that you've called us to share the truth if we know you. I pray that we would be faithful in doing that with everybody, but especially with the Jewish people during this time of Passover that we know points so clearly to you. I thank you for your love for us, Lord. I thank you for this technology that we can be together even though we're not together. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you are a God who's worthy of praise, worthy of remembering your redemption year after year. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you for joining us for this Passover experience. We hope it's been a blessing for you and you've been encouraged by this time together as we celebrate the Messiah and the Passover. If you'd like to learn more about Life and Messiah and the ministry that we uh, are involved in, you can go to our website. You can also sign up there for different mailings that we have to keep you updated about what God's doing around the world as we share the gospel with Jewish people. Uh, that's the website lifeinmessiah.org, lifeinmessiah.org. And if also God, uh, God leads you to partner with us financially, there's opportunities there on the website that you can do that as well. Uh, again, thank you so much. We've enjoyed having you in our home. Hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. And Shana Haba by Yerushalayim. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. It's uh, always great for us as a family to gather together and celebrate Passover every year, remembering the redemption that God has brought to us. I'm glad that we could be together for this Good Friday service and, and celebrate this together as well. As you heard earlier, my name is Stephen Cawthon. I work with Life and Messiah International. We moved down here to South Florida two years ago for the specific purpose of finding ways to reach out to the Jewish community here with the gospel. We have a heart for all people to hear the gospel, but especially for the Jewish people, God has burdened us that we want to see them hear the truth and come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So we are involved in sharing the gospel through street evangelism, through developing relationships, talking with people, but also one thing that God has led us to is working with local churches and believers to equip people on how to share the gospel with their neighbors. You guys probably know, but here in South Florida, the population is about 9% Jewish, and in some areas it's even higher, especially here in Hollywood. And so we feel that one of the greatest ways to reach the Jewish community is just through the friendships and relationships that you already have and, and being equipped on how to effectively share the gospel in a culturally relevant way with Jewish people. And so we've done trainings at Sheridan Hills about uh, evangelism, general evangelism, and also with other churches. We would uh, love to talk with you if you have a heart for this, if you have an interest in hearing about how you can be better equipped to share the gospel with your Jewish neighbors, or if you just want to hear more about our ministry and what God's done in our lives and what He is doing and what plans we have going into the future, we'd love to get together with you sometime and share about these things. So have a great rest of your Good Friday, and we look forward to celebrating whatever surprise there is for Easter together with you guys.